So thank you. Uh, anyway, I've been asked to review for you what's in the field of anatomy and biomechanics of the wrist. I'll share with you some ideas on how the carpal bones move, that is on wrist uh, kinematics, as well as on how much load without yielding are allowed by this articulation without suffering injury, of, of course. So we'll be talking about kinematics, we'll be talking about kinetics. And as you well know, it's not an easy articulation, and it's not an easy articulation to understand, and much less to master. Probably it's one of the most complex composite joints in the human body, although I know that people on the, on the shoulder or on the knee may think otherwise, but I think that it's one of the most difficult to understand composite articulations. It comprises 15 bones, um, 24 joint facets, that means 24 contacts, different contacts, 24 ligaments, more or less 24, 26, but only 24 ligaments are meaningful. We have 24 tendons and also three neurovascular structures. Why is that? Why do we need such a complicated wrist? This is the first question I would like to share some, to, to, to munch about. I mean, uh, do we need a complicated wrist? Because uh, do we have the need for moving it on one side and to be uh, stable on the other? So we need mobility to place the hand in that position that ensures a grasping efficiency with the minimal energy cost. We need to place the hand over there. Of course, the shoulder, elbow, and forearm uh, are particularly well placed to reach uh, the object, but it's the wrist, the one that has that delicacy, that, that, that possibility of placing the hand right, right, right in the position that is needed, and also um, the one that uh, will save uh, energy. But also we need stability. We need the stability to make sure that the wrist is re uh, getting all the load, a lot of load, and guarantee that adequate transfer of loads from the hand to the arm. So we need mobility, we need stability, which are the two most separated captures or characteristics of a joint that can be uh, in. So we, we need kinematics to understand mobility and we need kinetics to understand stability. Uh, of course, we need, as usual, to, to start by the anatomy, and I will do it uh, in a way that um, it's um, more retentive uh, in a way. So this is a sagittal cut of a, of a fitted, and sorry, of a specimen, and the lunate, you can see that it's there, uh, in between the capitate and the radius. It's like a floating, a floating uh, um, bone, but it, actually it's not, it's inherently unstable, of course, uh, but, but uh, you need you, you need uh, the positioning uh, to position that bone. We, we need the scaphoid and lunate. So if it was a link ligament like this, without no neighbors, that would be completely unstable. This is the, the antebrachial fascia uh, and the antebrachial glenoid, I mean. It's the antebrachial glenoid, meaning that uh, there is the radiocarpal joint and uh, this extension towards the TFCC. The proximal concave articulation, scaphoid foot fossa, lunate fossa, followed by the TFCC, and separated by that ridge between the lunate and the scaphoid. It's a small ridge, interfacet ridge, that uh, was called by my friend um, Dick Berger. Uh, distally, we have the convex, uh, the convexities of a scaphoid lunate and triquitrum. Look uh, how little triquitrum we have actually in, in this articulation. Triquitrum it's more a different bone. It's not a bone for load uh, bearing. It's a different thing. We'll talk about that later. This is the mecapal joint. The most important by, by any means uh, is, uh, it's, it's not to say that the bradycarpal joint is not important. Mecapal joint is important and it has three different shapes or three different articular uh, surfaces. On the lateral side, we have the scaphoid, which is convex proximally, and con uh, the concavity is made by the trapezium trapezoid and, and capitate. And then we have a central portion that it's concave proximally and convex distally. So it's kind of a, a change in the shape that goes from convex into a concave uh, zone. And this is followed by the triquitrum, which is more like a saddle joint articulation between true quitrum and hemi. 
the three uh, sectors uh, work together in a way that the distal row is um, articulating with the proximal row in different ways, in different shapes. Even there's that, that variation, anatomical variation uh, of the lunate that, that implies several things. It goes far beyond just the one anatomical variation that it's worthless. It's very, very important to recognize that lunate type one is a, a lunate that um, allows only one contact with the capitate. That means that there is more rotation, there is more predisposing uh, instability at scape lunate uh, joint. And also scaphoidal unions in that particular type of, of injury, uh, um, of uh, shape of the micapal joint, uh, the, um, uh, the scaphoid tends to have non-unions more often than not. On the other hand, we have the other, the bicondyla type, where the lunate has two articular uh, surfaces distal, one for the capitate, another for the hamate. And this has, um, well, more stable, of course, but also has some predisposing condition uh, are the scaphoid STT osteoarthritis are clearly, clearly in that in that uh, type of lunate. More more often, we have a hemicondomalacia, proximal pole as well, and those omnicarpal instabilities are more frequent in that case. Also, uh, the ulnates, uh, it tends to be shorter, and that's why that there's some some saying on on a predisposing of this uh, shape of the of the micarpal joint to Kimbox disease. Well, uh, there, there are many, many problems with the risk that to understand is that uh, we are just classifying things clear cut in, uh, let's say this is a ligament, this is a fashion. No, there's not, nothing like a, a risk that it's, um, there's that clear cut definition. There's a fascia or retinacular. There are capsular thickenings that may be as important as ligaments. And we need to understand that there's a lot of uh, research to be done in that, in that uh, area. Particularly important is to know what's a ligament and what is not. A ligament is uh, an inextensive um, soft tissue that goes with parallel fibers from one bone to another. And that's important because um, uh, anything that has the ability of elongating far beyond 8% of the initial length should not be, at least uh, according to Savio Wu from, from California, should not be considered a ligament. For a ligament, we need something that is strong, it's stiff, and, uh, and we need to at least uh, see how much elongation it allows. 8% is uh, what uh, they are considering the limit between a ligament and a non-ligament. Does it mean that the rest are not ligaments? Of course not. This is the classification, anatomical classification of rest ligaments. Obviously, there are many shapes, many, many uh, anatomical anatomical variations in the way, uh, or in the not only in the way that they are inserted uh, and originate, but also in the way they are related to each other. These are ligaments. Uh, there are many, 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 uh, many different uh, classifications, but this is quite interesting. Um, it talks about uh, extrinsic and intrinsic ligaments. Extrinsic ligaments are those that connect uh, forearm bones with the uh, carpal bones. And intensive ligaments are the ones that connect or link or um, connect between uh, bones uh, to each other. Um, in this regard, let's review all the ligaments uh, or at least the ligaments that are more meaningful. These are the extensive ray carpal ligaments, palmar side. You can see that they are uh, kind of a fun shape uh, distribution or origin and. Uh, some of them are thicker, some of them are difficult the, to understand or, or to the, delineate, but uh, the, they are there almost always. The, the short radial lunate, I'll be talking later about that. And we have the ulnar triquitral, ulnar capitate, and ulnar lunate ligaments on the ulnar side, emerging all of them from the ulnar and fanning out in the carpus. Then we have the intrinsic proximal row palmar, we have the polar. Uh, scaphoidate, a uh, lunotracheal ligament. The more important one is this one, and then we have the palmar crossing ligaments uh, across the carpal, the micarpal joint, from the from the um, from the triquitral towards the hamate and capitate, fourteen and fifteen, and then we have on the other side we have the two collateral ligaments, uh, sixteen and seventeen. Those are collateral ligaments in the sense that they are collateral ligaments for the uh, dart throwing motion. 
we'll be talking about later on. Those are the interosseous ligaments uh, connecting the ball, volar size of the volar aspect of the hame capitate trochitrum trapezium and trapezoid. Those are now dorsal, dorsal extrinsic, it's the dorsal radius fracture already carpal ligament. Then we have the dorsal interosseous ligaments between scaphoid, lunate, and triquitrum. We have both uh, the 12 and 13, uh, those are interosseous ligaments. The 11 is the so called scaphoid triquitral ligament. It's an extension, it's really difficult to differentiate one from each other. Then we have the dorsal intercapal ligament, tri tri triquitro, trapezio, trapezoidal. Uh, how, to, uh, how to name these ligaments? Uh, we usually start always by the radial side and, and the last is the ulnar side, except in this one we call the triquitro, trapezio, trapezoidal, because it's obviously that this one is emerging from the triquitum and the rest is more like a very thin, uh, insertion on the on the radial side. And then we have the distal dorsal trapezoid trapezoidal, dorsal trapezoid capitate and dorsal hame capitate ligaments. What about uh, collateral ligaments? There has been a lot of controversy about that. Uh, those are really ligaments are not. Usually they are not uh, from two perspectives. One from uh, from a histological histologically perspective. If you look at this uh, histology, you'll see that there is a crisscross strike of network of fibers, and there's a lot of uh, cells. Uh, this is not what uh, we were talking about. This is loose connective tissue. It's not talking about uh, uh, elongation. Elongation-wise, uh, it's something that they, it may allow up to 30 or 30 or more uh, from the initial length. So this is going to be a true ligament. It doesn't mean that the, if I say that it's not a ligament, I'm just dismissing this as something inter interesting to note. It's very important, the only collateral ligament, in that case, it's uh, nothing but the floor of the issue. And the floor of the issue in radial extension, which is the extreme of uh, dart throwing, it's a very important structure. So maybe it's not a ligament, but it's certainly in that very position is acts functionally as a ligament. The same we can we can say for the, the radial collateral ligament that uh, some people call it the radial scaphoid ligament. In fact, it has that orientation that it's the floor of the APL, the floor of the APB, and it's a re, uh, it's ready to control that anaflexion uh, position that it's at the end of the dart throwing rotation. What about the short radial lunar ligament? This is one of the areas that we have advanced the least. This is a very important structure. I'm not saying that a ligament, even though people call it ligament, but it's not. But uh, look at look at how thick it is, and look at uh, how this uh, ligament, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, insert into the radius and insert into the lunate with a high, uh, wide, wide, wide uh, insertion site. It's an important. It's such important that thickening. Let's call it the uh, capsule of thickening. It's that important because without this ligament, or, or let's say if we have that ligament intact, you cannot have a DC beyond 20 degrees, or you cannot have a VC beyond, uh, let's say, uh, uh, 20 degrees either. Because this ligament, as a matter of fact, it's a functional ligament, it's a thickening that is there and prevents not only that DC VC, but also the translocation of the carpus towards the ulna. Having said that, uh, let's say that this is a, another important concept that usually is missing in most, uh, in most uh, um, talks. We should consider the wrist as a complex system of pulleys. The pulley system, the fully function of the wrist is something that cannot be done by nobody else. I mean, the pulleys are there. All these pulleys are important. All these pulleys are not, not only the six dorsal compartment, but also the flexocapiradialis compartment for, for the, in the volar site and the carpal tunnel. It is an important structure and it's to be considered as an important uh, function for the wrist. Why is important? Well, you know that if we have a separation of the tendon from the center of rotation, we are increasing the lever arm of the tendon and the tendon will will uh, then oblige the, the, contra, the, the antagonist the muscle to be uh, much, uh, much thicker just to compensate for that. Mm -hmm. And while uh, if we use that, that, um, that uh, uh, 
pulley, we have reducing the, the lever arm and the moment arm of the tendon will be balanced to the dorsal, uh, dorsal moment arm for the extensors and that makes things much easier. Pulleys are not irrelevant. The pulleys are very important. And finally, the final word, uh, as much as uh, anatomy is concerned, we, we should all recognize there are no such a thing as two identical breasts. There are no two identical trees. There are no two identical individuals. The same for the breasts. You dissect four breasts, like in this case, and there's none that it's completely equal to the other. So let's um, make a plea for, well, tailor-made our treatments for whatever we think. Um, let's talk about kinematics. Let's talk about uh, how motion is conceived or how motion is produced within the wrist. And that's the first question. Do we really need a mobile wrist? That's a question that usually also big surgeons, I believe that, uh, or particularly the ones that uh, they see heavy men or workers, they believe that the wrist fusion has acceptable functional impairment and probably they are right. Probably they are right for that particular case, but remember, a fusion, it's not panacea. A fusion, it's something that we are losing. We are not, uh, we cannot uh, consider acceptable a fusion of the wrist just because uh, we have something to offer to the patient. I mean, we should uh, always uh, double think that fusions are not there to stay. Fusions are there just to molest. Uh, look at this case. I mean, in 20 patients that, that they, they saw long enough, they found that more than half, or at least the half of them, they had pain. They had the slight pain. They have a moderate pain uh, after a total refusion. The grip is not true that they, they recuperate or they have back all the, the grip strength. They don't. I mean, the grip gets uh, an average of 66%. So, um, and besides the return of employment, it's not the same as usually we are talking. We are talking about 60%, 70%, sometimes less than that of patients that can go back to normal life because of that wrist is rigid. On the other hand, uh, do you think that uh, you can play guitar with, with the wrist fuse? No, you cannot. You cannot beat a, a, an egg. You, you cannot uh, um, dust a surface of, I mean, there are so many uh, small things that you cannot do because of the risk uh, that it's arthritis, that uh, you should be careful. You shouldn't, we shouldn't offer fusion just because we don't know what to do. So what types of motion? We'll, we'll start by flexion extension to the only inclination, then we'll go to the dart throwers. Well, this is a general principle that uh, there is very little mobility between the, the bones of the distal row, between trapezium and trapezoid. Maybe there's two, three degrees, uh, but no, almost no motion there is between trapezoid and capitate and capitate hemate. There is no mobility. So let's consider the distal row as if it was one single uh, functional unit. The bones fit together like a stone in an arch uh, with, the, with the small uh, ligaments connecting one to each other. And the completely different story in the proximal row. In the proximal row have substantial intercapital mobility. Look at this is just my wrist in flexion and extension. You can see 27 degrees scaphoid lunate on extension, 62 degrees of a scaphoid and lunate inflection. That calls for three independent interdependent, of course, functional units in the proximal row. It's not the three bones that uh, each one moves um, at, at ease, no, they, 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 they uh, move a synergistic one to, to each other, but um, they are there as the three interdependent functional units. A second concept I, I would like to defend, uh, uh, it's uh, quite basic, is that um, as, you, as you can imagine, there are no tendon insertions on the proximal row. All the tendons, except the one that goes into the pisiform, and the pisiform obviously gets into the hamate, uh, all the tendons go distal or into the distal row or beyond that. So because of that, uh, the, uh, since there are no, uh, no tendon insertions, wrist motion will start always at the distal row. This row will start moving, and the, the ligaments that connect the distal row with the proximal row, the ones that cross the mid carpal joint, will pull the proximal row, and that will uh, create some compressive forces between the distal and the proximal row, and that will be the one that will force the proximal row to move. 
So we have the proximal row that starts moving and a random interposition, this only mid cap of motion. Only the, the capitate and the distal row articulate on the scaphal lunate joint. There is only motion at the mid cap of joint. And then this is uh, reflected in that, um, in that schematic. In the neutral position, there's only mid cap of rotation. Inflection, maximum extension, maximum inflection. Then there's much more rotation between at the other leg. So the mid couple joint is important. And this comes from, from the, um, the work by Hisao Moritomo, uh, in which uh, he showed perfectly well how the lunate and the radius work as if they was one unit. And in fact, this is it. I mean, the mid couple joint is so important as for that. Distal radial ulnar joint inclinations are fine. I mean, in radial inclination, because the distal row wants to approximate to the radial styloid, you need the, the scaphoid to give way uh, to flex uh, so that the distal row can manage to go into that direction. While on the other side, you have the ulnar deviation, the scaphoid extends just to fill the gap that opens between the distal row and the radial styloid. This is also in the Mohen uh, example that uh, provided uh, to many people. In 2003, you can see the scale foot in blue, how much uh, rotates and translates, rotates in flexion, rotates in extension. The lunate in, blue, in yellow, you can see that uh, in this position, radial deviation, we can see the distal portion. And the, the triquitum that it's in red, you can see that only we can see the, the distal ceiling of the bone in radial deviation, that means that there is that rocking chair type of motion between the proximal row and distal row. But this is not exactly true in everybody. I mean, you can see that the column wrist is the one that uh, behaves this way, in the way that the scaphoid, uh, it's flexing in radial deviation, in the extending in all deviation. But there's a, and there's a finding by John Stanley and, and Cragen, uh, from the, the um, from the UK as well, uh, that uh, they found that there are patients that there is only a row breeze that they call it row breeze because there is no flexion extension. Uh, there is no flexion extension. The scape foot gets flat, uh, extended and remains extended even in radial deviation. And this is because it's not exactly true that everybody has the same type of behavior behavior that, that goes from flexion extension, the more red one uh, would be the one that has probably more uh, type of uh, type two articulation. Well, the type one, probably it's more the one that uh, the, the, there is no flexion extension. Basically you have that translocation. Between the two in the beginning, when, when they, they started talking about that, they always say, well, there's, there's some rarity cases that go this well as, as a row. Uh, well, there are others that are more like column. And we believe that uh, everybody was on the same blue type of, uh, of line. And it's not true. I mean, there's a spectrum of, uh, of ways of uh, uh, between one and the other. What about the throwing motion? The throwing motion is very important. It's so important that uh, until we, we saw it clearly, I mean, we didn't understand very much uh, what was going on. Now that we understand this concept, we understand almost everything and that uh, has a clinical importance as well. Yeah, well said. The wrist um, very seldom moves along the frontal or sagittal planes. It always has uh, an oblique type of motion from extension, radial deviation, and flexion on a deviation. This is the so-called dart throwing motion, very popular by now, but it was something that about uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we didn't even consider much. This is the motion that it's most commonly used in activities of daily living from fractional radiation to extension radial deviation. And believe it or not, uh, it was discovered, this, this factor was discovered by way, way, way before that, uh, that, um, that Turian uh, paper, that uh, chapter by jo um, Geoffrey Fisk, it was way before that in Compton, as a matter of fact, he realized that there was that, that oblique uh, plane of motion. But the one who said that it was uh, throwing it out, the one that used the expression throwing it out was Geoffrey Fisk. Geoffrey Fisk was the one that started considering this as the true physiological axis of extension flexion. He was not talking about the orthogonal flexion extension in the sagittal plane. 
It was talking more about throwing a dart as the more basic uh, motion of the wrist. Not that uh, he thought that uh, everybody in the world was throwing that. It's just the concept of uh, uh, external rotation, uh, external uh, extension and flexion on a deviation. Um, this, is, uh, this is the plane of uh, flexion extension that uh, he's calling for. It's produced on one side by two important uh, tendons, the CRL in this case, the CRB as well. And on the other side, you have the FCU as uh, the other antagonist, the antagonist muscle that uh, allows you to do this motion. What happens when, when you dart throw? When, when you dart throw, you know the, the proximal row is in neutral. And as you go into radial deviation, it should go into flexion because all the, as we have said before, I mean, uh, the skate foot needs to flex. Otherwise the distal row cannot radially deviate. Um, but uh, it will not flex, it will stay in the same position if you also extend the wrist at the same time. Look at here, on the neutral position, it has an alignment. On the radial extreme, radial inclination and extension position has the same alignment. So there has no, if you go from that position to the other, there's no much rotation of the proximal row. That means that the rotation occurs into the mid couple joint. Again, in neutral position, if you go into a deviation, you would extend the proximal row, but it will not extend because you have also flexion involved. And again, you have the, the difference between the neutral and the inclination is, the, is exactly the same while in the middle was different. What does it mean is that if you perform the dart throwing rotation, the lunate will not rotate. The lunate will stay still. And what you have is the mid couple joint, the one that rotates basically. And this is the proof, uh, and again, this is a patient of mine, long, long patient of mine. Uh, that means that it's a long time. I fused the really scaphoid infusion. I had to resect the distal scaphoid and see how much that rotating ro rotation he's got. I mean, you couldn't pick what, what, size, or what size was uh, operated on because he's got normal dart throwing despite the fact that the really carpal joint was fused. What about the reverse dart throwing? Well, the reverse dart throwing is the opposite. Well, actually it's not opposite. It's, it's the one that's mediated by the EC on one side, on the flexor capillaryalis on the other side. And the direction of motion, obviously because uh, it's the opposite, uh, you have all the rotation in the radiocarpal side. On the radiocarpal joint, obviously in radial deviation, it flexes. But if you follow the flex, you have a lot of flexion over there. While if you go into extension, on a deviation, you have extension, on a deviation, you have a lot of rotation at the radial couple side. And that's why we are talking now that instead of using the anatomical coordinate system done in blue, that uh, we were doing it a long time ago, if we use instead of this, if we use this oblique, uh, oblique uh, axis to understand what's going on in the wrist, the similar can be found in the ankle as well. Uh, you'll you'll get better off because the mid couple rotation only occurs into this plane on a flexion radial extension, and the radial carpal motion occurs in this plane between on extension and radial flexion, and between the two you have all these between the dart thrower uh, rotation and reverse dart throwing. There's a combined rotation between of the the two, but. Um, at least you have that order. I mean, yeah, it's like uh, balancing your, your way of thinking. Uh, you have that and you understand now that, that this is much easier to understand that when we were trying to understand motion by combining the two axes in the same. It's not, it's not completely easy. Uh, I mean this and take it for granted. The wrist is a mechanism far too complex. It's very complex as to be optimally described using simplified mechanical models. This is the mechanical model that we could um, think about uh, a universal joint, a cardan type of joint that by the way, Henley in 1871, he described that for the wrist. Uh, and then that was forgotten. The idea now has been recuperated for this. No, it's not perfect because the, it has an intercalated segment of rigid one, and, and we know, we have said that the proximal row has no rigid, rigid, rigid situation. 
What about the risk kinetics? Well, the risk kinetic, uh, it's, to me, it's more important for, uh, in the sense that uh, it, uh, we have gone through it much more deeply. This is a, a risk, it's, a, you know, it's aside from being very mobile, it's also a load bearing articulation, it sustains tractions, it sustains torsions, it sustains a lot of compressions without yielding. And this is the character, this is the point. I mean, the fact that the wrist can do it without yielding is what explains stability. In fact, all hand activity generate axial forces. I mean, there's no need to, for you to be in a gymnast um, to get the forces at, uh, across your wrist. I mean, uh, no matter what you do, you always create some forces into the and the question again is how can the wrist sustain that amount of loads uh, if you wish? Uh, uh, well, because there's a complex uh, arrangement, not only of ligaments, but also muscles, also sensory motor system, proprioception. We'll be talking about proprioception one day, but, but not today. Today we'll concentrate on ligaments and muscles. How ligaments reach that point where the wrist can move and at the same time can be stable under load. And the muscles are, as you automate the stabilizers, how they work. This is gonna be my, my, my role today to explain ligaments and to explain muscles. Ligaments. Ligaments, um, well, usually uh, the ones that we are, we remember that the ligaments were given all the responsibility. We, we thought that ligaments were the only stabilizers for quite a long of time, not, not long ago. We realized that that was not true. It's not true that the ligaments are the only stabilizers. But um, how this principle of uh, tensegrity works is, is something that is very intuitive. We have that, that um, bone that is on the surface that will slide down towards the, towards the ulna. You have that. And if you have an extra loading, obviously you will have tension on that ligament, but also you will have some compression as well. The compression is the fact that uh, it provides the stability. Because uh, if you have more axial loading, if the axial loading increases, you have the tension increase, but also the compression. So the more, the more you tout, the more you tout, the more compress, uh, compresses the bone towards the, the radius. And of course, if that was true, if that was the only true, you should crack, uh, you should uh, fracture, you should get uh, some instability if there was any rupture of the ligament. So ligament rupture in this case would be the precipitation of instability always. And this is not true, not true. You may have one ligament rupture and there's nothing happening because there's secondary stabilizers, what we call isodynamic ligaments. The concept of isodynamism, I think it's a, an important concept that has been forgotten quite a while. I mean, um, we are treating all the ligaments as, as if they were alone in there. And they are not alone. Uh, usually uh, you may have a ligament, uh, several ligaments may become taut. Some may become loose if you apply an axial load. You have applied an axial load and the STT and the dorsal scaphoid ligament become very, very tight. And the ones that react similarly and simultaneously to that external force, they are said to be isodynamic. Those are the isodynamic ligaments. Uh, the concept, I think, that uh, it came, came quite a long time, but the, it's a concept that it's quite uh, clearly that there are two ligaments that one may help each other. So if the loading is not excessive, isodynamism allows the substituting ligament ruptured by another ligament as long as they are isodynamic. And we have done that, uh, this is a, a work in the lab, that uh, we have done several studies uh, trying to find what the, the isodynamic stabilizers, what the secondary stabilizers are. Otherwise, if we believe that uh, we have one, one ligament ruptured and we apply the a load, uh, some, we, we need to know what's the secondary stabilizer that will put that into a balance. For instance, um, this is a scaphoid, you apply a load and everybody knows that the scaphoid will flex and on the on the other side, the, the triquitum will extend and the, that load, triquitum extension, scaphoid flexion, this is quite known. So 
let's see what ligaments are the ones that will um, prohibit uh, some uh, abnormal uh, alignment if there is one ligament rupture. Again, we have uh, axial load applying and the, uh, the scaphoids rotates and flexes, pronates and flexes. The extension supination mode for, for the ulnar side. We have that uh, as, as if there was a towel. The more you rotate that towel, the more twisting there is, the more compact that becomes. That provides the stability of the proximal wall, as long as there is connection between the scaphoid and triquid. If there is good connection, you have that stable. And you have that stability that then what it has is that the scaphoid goes into flexion. And because of that, the distal row needs to pronate. And pronates because it adapts to that situation of the scaphoid flexing and the trochotum extending. So that situation then blocks the mid-couple joint. We've said that before that the proximal row has been blocked by the, that uh, opposite direction torques. And now we have everything that the slides towards Yolna because of the compact, uh, compact uh, ball of the condyle of the carpus slide down until the, the short radial ring ligaments and the extensive ligament that we saw before were tightening. So that's the basic uh, example. And this is one of the, the specimens that we are loading it. Actually, quite a lot of load, by the way. And if you look at the thumb, you will see that pronates it rotates in a way that there is no other rotation than pronation, and uh, we have that as a result of the skid foot flexing and the trachytum extending, trachytum extends, and the lunate translocates only. So these four are the basic, basic rotation uh, mode that, that we have in the carpus when we apply an axial load. What ligaments would uh, prevent those from happening? Let's see uh, if we can find. Um, an answer to that. Particularly if you, if you want to now to uh, pronate the capitate, the capitate, if you want a pronation, you need the scaphoid capitate ligament will prevent that from happening. The scaphoid will not allow the capitate to hyperpronate because uh, of this ligament. It's very strong. The one that we saw before that, that was a collateral ligament for, for uh, that throwing. A scaphoid uh, to the trachea have the dorsal in the capital ligament. We've seen that before. The dorsal scaphoid ligament as well. The one uh, in purple that it's a dorsal neutral ligament. This is less important, but all this, it's a continuation of the scaphoid capitate and goes around the, the, the proximal wall. Once in the in the ball side, the triquitrum, uh, lunate, and uh, radial styloid are uh, connected by the long radial lunate and the lunar triquitrum and the radius key for capital ligament as well. So we have that, that arrangement. It is kind of a helical uh, arrangement of ligaments, set of ligaments that they are all isodynamic. Isodynamic ligaments in the sense that whenever you have that pronation distally, you have that system that goes around the proximal wall and goes into the carpal tunnel, inside the carpal tunnel until the, the radial uh, styloid, this is a system, it's the anti-pronation ligament. The one that we call helical anti-pronation ligaments, hapons. Those are the ligaments that are there just to prevent that hyperpronation that we were suspecting to have that, that problem. You could do the same and you could apply another type of uh, load, no, not only axial, lo uh, axial loading, you can traction and produce uh, the same type, except that it's the opposite. You have flexion in the, onto the trochoidum extension on the, on the scaphoid, you have that supination as opposed to pronation, and you have that radial translation as opposed to the translation. This would be the type of displacement that you would see in the carpus by applying an axial traction. And that axial traction can be counteracted by those ligaments, no other. Those are the ligaments that would be um, isodynamic in those cases. STT on one side, volar escaphronate. Remember that before we were talking, the dorsal escaphronate. No, this is the volar escaphronate and non lunate ligaments. And then you have the capitate that wants to supinate, but it cannot supinate because you have the anti supination ligament, tricuitral capitate, hamate, and those are already tricuitral ligaments. Those would be uh, um, uh, two um, examples of uh, schematic representation of the radial antisupination ligaments to the right and the ulnar antisupination ligaments to the left. 
And those are the ligaments that, uh, on theory, would, um, would uh, stabilize the breast, should they be alone. If they would be alone, they could um, reach some sort of equilibrium, but not completely. Not completely because the ligaments cannot be the only carpal stabilizers. If they were, uh, we would have a lot of trouble. For instance, this is the way of uh, those ligaments because they have that opposite direction, obliquity. Um, the fact that uh, you are producing that uh, traction, you are uh, ensuring stability in the, and the traction as well. And that, that's the point I was mentioning. The ligaments cannot be the only stabilizers because they are, are stiff, but not that strong. See, the maximum ligament that can produce a good, good purchase, a good uh, stability, is the long, the, the voluntary ligament. It's uh, as much as 353 newtons, the ones that can be, uh, can be supported by this ligament. It's not enough. I mean, we need proprioception, we need muscles. Proprioception, proprioception is uh, the quality. It's one of the most important factors in stability. Will be discussed another day by, by my friend, um, uh, Elizabeth Hager, probably, uh, she will uh, teach us about proprioception. It's simply just to show you what proprioception means. Proprioception is something that happens whenever there's a one, um, one motion, one force that it's about to dislocate one ligament. Uh, it's about to dislocate that base of the metacarpal. You have uh, mechanoreceptors in the ligament, and th those are the mechanoreceptors that will um, combine with the spinal cord and you have that system and the system goes towards the muscle and the muscle is the one that will reduce them it will fight against that instability so we have that that situation in which the ligament is first it's the first line of defense but the ultimate uh, stabilizer will be the muscle and the muscle will be tall by mechanoreceptors by the proprioception that is producing the mechanical receptors. And that means that there is also the, the sensory motor system, the one controlling all of this. My final comment today is going to be about the muscle. How can muscles avoid ligament injuries? I mean, uh, if you look at this preparation, the muscles are set in a way that they all will compress the wrist. And it's difficult to understand how, by compressing the wrist, by contracting all the muscles, how can you assure that there is a stability? Well, the role of muscles has been studied in many different ways. This is the way that we have been uh, looking at those uh, since quite a long time already. We are producing the same type of experiment that we did before with that motion tracking device on the fast track. And we were setting uh, all those little, little wires into the different uh, carpal bones and applying loads by uh, pulling tendons. The tendons uh, that we are pulling are producing changes inside of the carpus. And those are the changes that teach us how the muscles may react in those situations. May react, uh, this is the, one of the first uh, specimens that we could see that by pulling some tendons, we are pronating the carpus and others are supinating the carpus. As you can see, there's a pronation, supination, rotation of the carpals. And it's a rotation of the carpals. I'm sure about that because the, the radius and the ulna are connected by two uh, stamen pins. And those are the ones that do not allow that the pronation, the, these apparent pronation, supination to be forearm pronation, supination. Those are intracarpal pronation, supination. And this is why, uh, how can we know that this is intracarpal? Well, uh, those are, you know, it's another specimen that was cut distal and proximal from, from the breast. And you can see the position of the ECU, for instance, over there. It's dorsal at the level of the, of the ulna, but it's anteromedially located into a distal insertion. It's marked by uh, small metallic markers. And this is the, um, the way that uh, we have or uh, have devised just to explain why those, uh, those tendons, aside from their own job, aside from their own job, what they can do in, in the, in, at its level. See, ECU is dorsal at the level of the ulna. It's inserted on the medial side of the hamate. And because of that, and because there are no motion between all those, uh, a contraction, an isometric contraction of that muscle produces that pronation of the distal row. 
It's one of the strong intercapital pronators, the ECU. On the other side, we have the extensor capital radialis longus and APL. Those are the tendons which contraction produce supination. So we have pronation and we have supination. Those are supinators, this is pronation. Supination and pronation. We have that ability, like the reins, uh, the reins of a horse, uh, the ability of um, rotating or pronating the distal row proximally, uh, relative to the proximal, relative to the radius, the distal row pronates uh, or supinates as much as we want. We have that option, and uh, see those are the numbers, the real numbers of 30 specimens that we, we conducted. And you can see how much rotation, it's minimal, but certainly it's significant, the fact that the ECU, it's a strong pronator, see four degrees plus minus 1.7, uh, as opposed to supination from the ECRL and APL. And this is, I think, uh, the most important slide of today, just to show how much uh, this uh, pronation and supination opens and closes the space of a, of a space of a scaphoid lunate in that situation. That means that supinators clo close the gap and pronators open the gap. That means a pronator is not a friendly muscle for that particular scaphoid lunate ligament rupture. Supinators on the other side, it's the one that closes it. So the supinator would be benefited by a specific muscle test, uh, muscle uh, rehabilitation in case of a scaphoid dissociation. And because of that, probably that explains why this, uh, this data was out in 1993 and we didn't pick much, we didn't believe it much. And now I can say that this was exactly true. Out of 393 specimens dissected, 104 had completely ruptured, substantial rupture of a scaphoid ligament. And that, and the fact that there were so so little synovitis, so few cases with some synovitis, tell told us that those dissected cadaver specimens had been dissected, and that, that was just a finding. That means that the, you may have a consistent, substantial scaphoid ligament ruptures, and yet you may balance that by just adding some control by the muscles. And that's the good news because that, that explains why in some patients we should start always by proprioceptively reeducating some specific muscles. So in summary, let's, uh, let's close this by saying that the wrist is very mobile, of course. It's a highly mobile articulation, but it's able to, to sustain considerable loads without yielding. And the fact of no, not to yield is the fact that that makes it uh, stable. And we'll be talking about that next week, about uh, when we talk about stability. About the neutral position, most motion occurs at the mid joint. And that explains why the really couple joint may be a spoil, maybe even arthritis, and yet you have a good mid rotation. And you have that throwing type of motion that involves mostly mid rotation as well. And that gives you, together with the previous one, gives you the impression of why the mid joint should be preserved as much as possible because it's the key, the key um, articulation in the wrist. Primary stabilization of the load of the wrist always uh, depends on integrity of capsule and ligaments. You have a good ligaments. Ligaments can never acting alone. Uh, all the ligaments acting as, um, as those uh, isodynamic ligaments, those are the ones that provide primary stabilization but the sensory model system, the one that uh, is using the proprioceptive information, mostly provided by ligaments and capsule to decide, is the one that uh, will decide what's the strategy, the best strategy for the muscles to do the ultimate priest stabilization. Uh, as usually, this, uh, this is not uh, mine. This is uh, a work or that has been done. There's a lot of uh, teamwork in Barcelona in many places. We are always uh, participating. Uh, thank you very much to all of them because uh, I could do nothing without their help. And of course, thank you, uh, all of you for being here.